hopefully it won't go too far. Okay, so yeah, I was, I was asked to mention that I don't have any disclosures um, to make at this time. And then um, I wanted to also say, okay, yeah, so today, I wanted, um, I'm excited to introduce you to a way of looking at and thinking about boys that recognizes their relational capabilities or, you know, what they're capable of knowing and doing in their relationships that considers how boys gender socialization, you know, pro towards social constructions of masculinity and culturally specific norms of masculine behavior can constrain their self-expression and um, impact their integrity and in relationships. And thirdly, to explore ways that um, all of us, you know, practitioners, parents, Parents, other adults who have boys' best interests at heart can support boys' efforts to preserve their healthy, preserve and develop their healthy connections to themselves and to others. Um, I thought I'd start by sharing a little bit about myself and then describe basically how I came to study boys, how I studied them, what I learned by studying boys in this way, and then talking um, more broadly about how to support. Um, boys' healthy development based on what I've learned, not only from my own research, but also from other research in this field that is um, focused on boys, men, and masculinities. Um, so, oops, let's see. Let me start with my background. So, um, as Dr. Kassman mentioned, my undergraduate work um, was in human biology at Stanford University. And from there, I went to um, Harvard Graduate School of Education, where I focused on human development in psychology um, and was advised and worked closely with Carol Gilligan. Um, and uh, as part of my doctoral work, I studied adolescent boys ages roughly 12 to 18, and then also studied boys at early childhood, ref, um, following them for two years from ages four through six. Um, while I was a doctoral candidate, I also worked at the Wellesley's Centers for Research on Gender, Women and Gender. And specifically, I was working on an adolescent sexuality project that was um, directed by Deborah Tolman and looking at the risk of unintended pregnancy. They had started out studying girls and then realized they needed to involve boys as well because boys were also involved in, in unintended pregnancy. And so I came in and headed that piece of it, like interviewing and, and um, developing measures to um, to assess what boys were experiencing um, in terms of their socialization, in terms of their conceptions of masculinity, and how that was impacting and correlating with some of their um, indicators of development and well being. Um, following that, for my postdoc, I was at NYU um, working on a project on adolescent friendships, particularly urban adolescent friendships with um, Niobe Way. And Carol was also um, transitioning from Harvard to NYU at that time. And so I continued to work under her guidance um, and supervision. And then finally, I returned back to the West Coast and have been teaching at Stanford a class on boys psychosocial development since 2003. And that follows um, basically research that focuses on infants through young adulthood. Um, also, as, as Dr. Kesson mentioned, I work with several nonprofits that mostly focus on supporting boys and men's healthy development throughout the lifespan um, and fostering their healthy connections to themselves and to other people. So that's a little bit about um, what my training looked at and where I came from. And so I thought I'd start with a, I'm a little bit nervous. I'm a nervous speaker, so please bear with me. So I started, thought I'd start with the story of how I came to study boys, because it's not always apparent how someone like me would would come into this topic. And that actually began after my first year at Harvard as a doctoral student. I went home for a few weeks and I was chauffeuring my 13 year old brother and his friends around town. And one of his friends asked me, you know, oh, you know, Harvard, what are you learning there? And I said, well, one of the more interesting things I've I've learned this year was from a woman named Carol Gilligan. And she studies adolescent girls and, you know, she's helping to um, educators and practitioners to support girls' healthy development. And basically this boy says to me, you know, that's great and that's fine. Everybody's very concerned about girls right now. And it's, it's wonderful that they're looking at that. But you know what? There's stuff going on for us boys too and nobody's talking to us. And so then he decides, you know what? You should study boys. You can start with me. And so... I went back to Harvard that fall. I was taking a clinical interviewing class with um, Carol. 
And I mentioned to her what this boy had said to me. And she said, well, isn't that interesting that he wants to talk about this with you? And so for the assignments for that course, I went back and interviewed him. And you know, our first interview it was very much an open-ended kind of exploration. And I knew that you know, he said he had something to say. He spoke for two hours about his relationships, about you know, questions he had, about things he was trying to figure out. And so literally, uh, you know, boys led me to the study of boys. It was that they had something they wanted to say that I had not necessarily expected that they would want to talk about, or particularly that they would want to talk about with me. Um, and then from there, I did pilot studies um, and eventually, and that's where I'll talk about here. So how I studied boys was because of the um, theories and methods that I was learning um, from Carol, especially, um, I wanted to reconsider boys' development through a relational framework, through a gendered lens. And so I think I have, yeah. And so Carol, in case you're not familiar with Carol's work, Carol Gilligan and her colleagues at the Harvard Project on Women's Psychology and Girls' Development, what they, um, what they basically did was they they took the observation that for the first hundred years since psychology was a field, established as a field, most of the theories of human development in psychology were largely based on studies of white middle class men and boys. And so people of color, girls and women, people who identified as, you know, as um, as girls and women were literally missing from the, from the research and discourse. And so around the 1970s and 80s, feminist researchers and clinicians started to ask, you know, what would we learn if we, if we listened to and studied girls and women? And, and from an academic stance, you know, this was, you know, the Harvard Project was one of the, one of the efforts that, you know, in this, in this new investigation of this new, you know, relatively new field. And then from a clinical side, it, um, people at, you know, Jean Baker Miller, Judith Jordan, Jan Surrey, the, um, at the Wellesley, Wellesley Stone Center, were looking at it from a clinical perspective. So they were working with their clients and patients. And then Harvard was studying, you know, undergraduates and also, you know, uh, kids in middle schools and high schools. And so they, and they kind of converged because um, the it, original, intention was kind of like, well, if most of the theories and models of human development psychology have been based on boys and men, then we know about that. Then, the, So the original intention was to create kind of complementary models. So now we need to create models about girls and women that start from listening to girls and women. And that was, you know, kind of the plan. But what happened was in listening to girls and women, particularly using the methods that they used, it changed the conversation. What they were hearing changed the conversation. And specifically, what happened was it listening to girls and women revealed aspects of people's lives and experiences that hadn't been represented in the theories and models that were based on boys and men. It's not to say that they weren't relevant, it was just or or that they weren't um things that boys and men were experiencing. It was that the boys and men weren't mentioning them in their interviews or in, in those studies. And, and like I said, part of it has to do with the methods that were used. Um, as many of you may know, for a long time, psychology tended to um, lean more heavily towards um, kind of experimental studies, which is you know great for asking certain kinds of questions for sure. So I'm not trying to say you know, one method over another, but it was kind of a black box approach to psychology, which was like, oh, the human being, you know, the mind, it's like a black box and you can kind of smell it, shake it, you know, kind of study it, but you couldn't really know what was inside. You could only make a best guess. And what the feminist researchers were um, kind of centering their methods on was the assumption or the belief that people could tell you about their experiences. And I guess the first concern is always like, well, they might lie about their experiences. So the the um, the methods were then very much focused on, well, so how can we create situations? How can we um, center the in psychological inquiries around relationships that are built on trust? How can we create a trusting, comfortable environment that will welcome people to share what they're really thinking and feeling within the context of a clinical, you know, of, of a clinical study or a psychological inquiry for academic purposes? And so um, that, uh, that's called, you know, what they, what, the Harvard Project and Carol Gilligan and her, her team called a relational approach or a voice-centered method um, to psychological inquiry. And by listening to girls and women, 
um, with a focus on understanding their lives and experiences from their own perspectives, that revealed things like the centrality of relationships, how central that was to the way that they saw themselves, the way that they engaged with other people, the choices that they made, you know, about, you know, even, even like a moral dilemma. One of the um, questions or exercises that was involved in the interview was the, the Heinz dilemma. And I'm sure you're, many of you are familiar with it, which is, you know, the man, his wife is sick. He, you know, he's, he can't afford the medicine. So he has to debate whether or not to steal the medicine. And so it becomes a question of, you know, an ethic of justice versus an ethic of care. Like, do we value human life and relationships above all else or do we value you know adherence to the law so those kinds of things we, they were finding where um, when girls and women talked through these kinds of decisions their relationships to other people and how they experience themselves in those relationships informed the kinds of conclusions and decisions that they were led to and so there was that um, kind of Kel Gilligan wrote a paper called the centrality of relationships um, she also wrote several books which I've listed here for your reference but um and then the other side of it was kind of recognizing or acknowledging that the human psyche is embedded in interpersonal relationships as well as social, cultural, historical, political contexts. And so it was important in order, if you wanted to understand what was happening for the person, you had to consider their context and contextualize their experiences. Um, so then the other side of this was because in addition to listening to women, they focused on girls at early adolescence. So the time between nine years old and 13 years old, and they were following or noting a transition in the ways that the girls were describing how they could be in their relationships. And that what they found basically highlighted was that the pre increased pressures to conform to societal constructions of femininity, what the girls described as the tyranny of the perfect girl or the tyranny of the nice girl, where you are supposed to seen and not be heard, where you weren't supposed to speak the truth because that might hurt people's feelings or it might not be the nice thing to say, how that could be detrimental to girls um, and their relationships, how it can make it difficult for them to bring their voices or their true selves into relationships. And that these um, struggles and failures to conform to societal norms and expectations wasn't necessarily a problem with individuals falling short, but perhaps a problem with the, the expectations that society had for girls and women to kind of distort and contort themselves to fit kind of ideals that were not compatible or, or well aligned in healthy ways to, you know, the actual human condition and what they needed and wanted and um, were capable of doing in their relationships. So what this did was it challenged um, the emphasis when, you know, to returning to kind of our understanding at that time in the you know, 70s and before of human development psychology being um, an emphasis on individuation and separation in the name of growth, maturity, and for boys and men, manhood. So the idea was that when you grow up, then you don't need people anymore. And to some extent, this is true. I mean, we learn to walk by ourselves without assistance and it all, you know do all sorts of things on our own. But it also implies a, I don't need anybody and so the, it kind of went to an, ex, a, a, an overly extreme version of like needing to constantly prove one's autonomy, prove one's independence, not simply being independent, but having to kind of, especially for, for you know, around notions of masculinity and which were very much bound up in or associated with notion definitions of success. It's like, I do it by myself. I didn't need anyone. I climbed here, you know, and I made it on my own. And so, or even like to give like a casual example, I remember um, when uh, when I was at Stanford and you know living in in Paris, and the woman, who, the other student who was living with the same family, she was homesick, and she felt and she was very upset because she felt like she had failed because she felt like the whole kind of task of that time at that age was to prove that she could do it on her own, and the fact that she missed her parents somehow was a flaw or a failure on her part. So it's kind of you know. That is just, you know, a, a rough casual example of the kind of notions that we may have or that we may, may even subconsciously associate with what it means to be successful. Successful in our society has come to be defined as you don't need anyone else when, of course, in fact, we actually do. So um, to go back to the work of the Harvard Project and the, what the feminist research on girls and women showed was that it basically called into question our conventional notions of what is normal and what is healthy and what does it mean to be well adjusted and it um, and in doing so because the focus was largely on girls and women it raised the question what about boys so like i said originally this work was meant to complement what we already understood about men and boys but it really opened up questions because it said well relationships aren't they important to boys and men as well you know even if they weren't talking about it in the studies it seems pretty evident that this is something that 
you know, is, is important to them too. And so could, so, you know, are could pressures and messages that um, push boys to conform to societal constructions of masculinity, like physical toughness, emotional stoicism, projected self-sufficiency, heterosexual dominance, could those similarly be harmful for men, boys, anyone who, who um, adheres to and strives towards those kinds of um, ideals, could those be harmful despite the social advantages um, of identifying as male or masculine? And so um, this brings me to, the, you know, what, again, more about how I study. So bringing in a relational framework to the study of boys or the revisiting or reconsidering of boys development. So what I was coming at was not only the work of Carol, Carol's work with the Harvard Project, but also um, a, a lot of literature that had come out of infant studies, for instance, um, Trevarthan's work, Tronic's work, Murray's work, and what these infant studies showed was that uh, people of all genders are born with a fundamental capacity and a primary desire to develop emotionally intimate bonds, close, meaningful relationships, responsive, mutual connections with other people. Right, and so we seek authenticity and reciprocity, and we know intuitively as month as early as at two months old when these things are lacking, when 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 people are responding inappropriately or falsely or in a veiled way. Babies pick this up, and there's I, you may have already come across this if you Google Tronic still face. Um, he did a series of studies. But there's a nice two minute video that shows this happening where he asked mothers to do a still face. You know, so they start out engaging with their infant and then they're told to be expressionless. And that the, you see in those two minutes, the infants go from being very happily engaged, company engaged to being very distressed because the mother is not doing what they, you know, kind of the dance of relationship they're engaging. In. And so basically the Tronic studies along with Catherine Weinberg were looking at kind of the possible impact of, you know, of depression in mothers or depression in parents and primary caregivers and how that could um, affect infants development and how they cope in, in those kinds of relationships. Um, Murray and Trevarthan also had this really brilliant study where um, I don't know how many of you in the room know this know the movie Speed, but it's kind of this idea of in the movie Speed when they're trying to rescue the hostages off the off the bus, they put the video on a feedback loop so it's playing the same same um, same tape so that the hostages can escape without the villain not seeing what was happening in real time. So what they did was they had the caregiver and the infant interacting, but on video instead of face to face. And what they do is they would just kind of freeze or appropriate in sync interaction. And again, these three month old infants picked it up on picked up on it and became distressed by it so that they are perceptive. So it's not so the idea, the the previous idea that, you know, we that people infants just wanted positive interactions and reinforcement was incorrect. It was that they need interactions to be appropriate and in sync with what's happening at the time. And they definitely depend. So I, I sometimes say too casually that like we have these BS detectors. We know when something is amiss. And then when people deny that, then that kind of can throw us as well. Like if a little kid says to their parent, you seem angry. And the parent says, I'm not angry when they actually are. What does that tell the kid about what they're picking up and whether they can trust their perceptions and whether they can express what they're seeing? So anyway, so I digress a little bit. So there was the infant studies that really demonstrated this fundamental, cap, you know, the capacity and desire. And then it also, um, some of you may be familiar with the um, Ad Health Study or the National Longitudinal Study on Adolescent Health, which was this enormous study. They surveyed nine over 90,000 adolescents. They interviewed over 12,000 of them from grades 7 through 10, 12, 7 through 12. And they found that the single best protector against psychological risk, like low self-esteem, depression, anxiety, and social risk, like risk of unintended pregnancy, dropping out of school, substance use or abuse, gang membership, the single best protector was having at least one close confiding relationship in their lives. It could be a mentor, a parent, a sibling, a friend, anyone. Kids who had, adolescents who had access to at least one close confiding protective relationship were much more protected against the, the usual risks that come with the challenges of growing up. And so this idea, again, kind of, I, I include these things as evidence of the relation, you know, kind of, taking a relational approach to understanding development so that um, 
it's not so much the idea that we develop in isolation with the option of having relationships, and it's great if we have them, but the fact that most human development, like socialization and including learning, happens mainly through and within our relationships with other people. Um, and it's within those relationships that, for instance, societal messages and social pressures become personally meaningful and directly consequential. So, and I also, and, and, and you may notice that some of these dates are from a while ago, but I, I want to say that that just means that we've known this for decades. I know that and right now there's a lot of kind of trending around um, put attention to the uh, loneliness epidemic, attention to the importance of together. And Vivek Murthy just wrote his book, you know, last year on you know, together, the importance of human connection and the power of human connection. So those have become come into the public awareness. And I think that's wonderful because I think it's absolutely important and um and very essential to you know actually supporting people in the ways that they need. But then the good news is that we've known about this, and so there's a lot of research-based evidence, not only for what contributes to the problem, but how the problem can be addressed in ways that are helpful and useful. Um, so it's not just a passing trend. Um, so, but back then, um, to my exploratory studies. So my studies were in light of relational theories that acknowledge that development and learning are relational processes, um, and then using relational methods that really um, centered on developing close, comfortable, trusting relationships, letting them get to know me, letting me get to know them before actually trying to interview or talk with them and have them share their experiences and perspectives with me. Um, that usually involved with um, both of the ages that I studied, which was adolescence and then early childhood, um, really kind of starting with like what you would call ethnographic observations, like going in, you know, kind of learning, uh, meeting them, learning what their culture that was kind of, you know, almost like an anthropological study, like going in and trying to figure out as, as an outsider, you know, how things are done here, what are the rules for conduct, what are the rules for engagement, um, and then, uh, sorry, and then, then going into semi-structured interviews. I think I might have meandered off when I was telling my story about how, how boys brought me in. Yeah, so I, when I, I, so this, I get to come back to it now, um, is I started out studying adolescent boys because as I said, the, the first boys that asked to speak with me were 13 years old. And so I, stud, I first um, spent time at public and private, co-ed and single sex, middles and middle and high schools, mostly in California and in Massachusetts. And what I was hearing from these 12 to 18 year old boys were, was, um, well, one of the things that I was hearing was that, that was, um, that the gap between the way boys are said to be like stereotypes, assumptions, expectations about boys as a group, and the gap between that and the, and how they experience themselves as individuals to be, that coming to accept that gap was a part of growing up. Like you just had to kind of suck it up and just realize that people are just not going to know you as you are because they're going, they're going to see you one way, decide that you're that, and there's very little that you can do if, if they're not making an effort to show them who you really are. And so when I talked to Carol about this, about this finding, she said, you know what, I think you should look earlier. I think you need to look at a time when they're not, when they're still kind of actively pushing against this expectation that there's something other than what they think they are. And her hypothesis was that what happens for girls during early adolescence, which is this kind of heightened pressure to accommodate social constructions of gender, starts earlier for boys and starts at early childhood. So like to give a kind of you know casual example, informal example, you know, girls are allowed to be tomboys for longer, right? We say, oh, that's great. You know, she loves to run with the boys. She loves to do sports. She loves to do STEM. She, all these things. We even celebrate it some, you know, in some places. <laughs> some countries still don't celebrate that. But like um, we, we, in the States, at least, we tend to encourage that. We say, oh, that, that's fine. But then when girls start to develop secondary sex characteristics, then they start to hear a little more like you need to act like a lady. I know that's a little more traditional, but you do still hear versions of that. You still, you know, girls are still, you know, prized, unfortunately, for their 
appearances and how they conduct themselves and having to be nice or having to figure out how to succeed and be nice, you know, all these things. So that's that kind of nice girl, perfect girl expectation is still there, but it usually comes in when they start to look, you know, develop secondary sex characteristics and start to look like young women. With boys, the casual example would be when, when you know, you ask yourself, when do you start, boys start to hear, boys don't cry, don't be a mama's boy, don't be sissies, or whatever the more modern day versions of those, those admonishments are. And you hear that a lot earlier. You hear that around age three, four. I've even heard at the zoo, I heard someone telling what looked like a one-year-old to me, boys don't cry. And this was a baby. I'm thinking, how else is, is, is he supposed to communicate? But um, so those messages come in earlier. Carol used to say, patriarchy goes after boys first. That's debatable. And we can see, you know, we can, we can, you know, you can have your opinions about that. But the the trends that we were seeing in the research were that girls were a, a permitted, it was more acceptable for them to kind of speak the truth, speak their minds up until they were, you know, coming up against this wall at early adolescence, where they were told, no, don't be too smart, don't be too loud, don't be too outspoken. The boys are learned, are told, don't be too close to your mom, don't be like the girls, don't be too this, that. Those messages seem to come in earlier. Um, okay, so sorry, <laughs> I'm getting excited and a little bit distracted. So so what, uh, let's see. So my overarching research question was how do boys experience and respond to their gender socialization? And like I said, using the relational methods, the focus was really on trying to understand boys' experiences from their perspectives, in their words, on their terms. So like I said, I spend a lot of time, you know, first situating myself in, the, in you know, because I stood out as a 20, at the time I was 24 years old, I was, you know, sitting in the hallway at an all boys school, you know, in the in the Northeast. And some of the teachers would be like, I can't believe you're getting credit at Harvard for doing this, because I was literally just hanging out and trying to kind of figure out, letting the boys get to know me, ask me what I was studying. And as they felt comfortable asking for volunteers, I was hoping to get maybe a dozen. I ended up interviewing about 58 and actually ran out of, you know, ran out of time. And, and my husband, who, who was then at the time my partner, was really surprised because he didn't think any of them would want to talk to me. But as I, as I mentioned from my you know, anecdote about how I came to study boys, they had a lot to say. And what they said was absolutely interesting to me. And I feel like it wasn't anything that I did that was extraordinary. It was I was in the right place at the right time. And they, they based, one of the boys at the end of his interview, one of the adolescent boys said to me, I'm telling you this because I know you really want to know. And I was so grateful and so thankful to him for that because I really did. I was um, coming from a place, Carol, when she teaches her clinical interviewing classes, you want to start from a place of not knowing. You know, you want to start from listening with curiosity and genuine interest. And when the when the person that you're listening to perceives that in you, then you get you get closer to their truth, right? You get closer to um to understanding what it is that, that they are capable of sharing with you. So um, so that was how I um, approached my exploratory studies was really just to say, you know, there's there, at that time in the 90s, there had been emerging books about boys, like, oh, you know, kind of almost a backlash to the stuff that was that had come out on girls. Cause like, oh, if girls can do these two, the, t the inclination was, yeah, boys too. Boys also have relationships. So of course boys do this in the same, exact same way. But the risk or danger was that just as it was wrong to impose on girls girls, theories of development and psychology that were based on boys' experiences. It was likewise wrong to impose on boys theories of human relationships that were based on girls' experiences. So the goal for me and, and, and working with Carol was just to really um, take an exploratory stance on this and to see what can we learn if we listen to boys in this way, which um, had, had been rarely done. I'm not going to say it had never been done, but studies like where that kind of went in and sought to listen to boys to understand their experiences and to see what they um, they could share um, were, were relatively rare at that time. So um, what I learned by studying boys in this way was that boys have relational capabilities. So consistent with those infancy studies at infancy, you know, these four-year-old boys, boys as young as four years old, were capable of being authentic, direct, articulate, and attentive. There's a chapter on each of those in my book. Um, and the, the, my book title is supposed to be when boys become quote unquote boys. So it's kind of when boys actual boys become more aligned with, you know, how boys are said to be. 
and what that process is. I found these young boys and also adolescent boys, because um, I, I also analyzed the data that I collected with the um, 12 to 18 year olds, they're capable of being fully present and genuinely engaged in their relationships. Um, so their relational capabilities, uh, some of the literature had said, oh, they used to have them, but then they're lost. They were not lost. They absolutely per persisted and carried through at least adolescence. And now there's obviously, you know, there's also evidence now of, you know, persist through adulthood as well. And that these capabilities are not as stereotypically believed to be feminine weaknesses, although they are often seen as liabilities when boys and men show them, but they're actually human strengths. And so the more that we can reframe them and help people understand that these are things that are essential to our health and our happiness and our well-being. And so directing boys away from that in, their, in the course of their socialization and development is not conducive. It will not serve them well. These relational capabilities are important to their professional as well as their personal relationships. And so it, it's a part of their humanity. And so base, um, however, these relational capabilities, boys' relational capabilities are often overlooked and or underestimated in the literature and in boys' everyday interactions. And one of the reasons that happens is that we don't, because we're influenced, myself included, were influenced by gender stereotypes, we don't expect to see them in boys. We don't expect boys to be really good at relationships, really attuned to other people, really, you know, astute about, you know, interpersonal dynamics. And then there, and social psychologists tell us we tend to notice and look for what we expect to see. And so that's one of the reasons we tend to kind of overlook or underestimate them. The other reason that they're overlooked and underestimated is that they're not always apparent. And that is in part a product or a result of boys' gender socialization. Boys are learned because they are taught to hide and deny their relational capabilities and their vulnerabilities. And, you know, spoiler alert, it's partly because we gender those things as feminine. And so we devalue, tend to devalue them as boys. And that's how it becomes a liability um, in, for boys and men. The, so that's that was the first kind of, of three main findings from my study. The second key finding was that um, because I, by focusing on boys at early childhood, I was able to kind of document or observe and document a shift in their relational presence. Um, it was a moment of transition. So this is a time, this is an age when bo most boys are entering schools for longer periods, for, for the first time, for some of them. And they're, you know, kind of uh, encountering or realizing the influence and importance of their peers. So whereas they may have spent more time with their families or primary caregivers or in a home setting and maybe go to school part-time, this is when they start going to school every day for at least a, you know, for a portion of the day and increasingly as they advance through their educations. And so what I found was, you know, when they were at age four, when we first, when I first entered the classroom and I went and I would observe, you know, kind of weekly through, through um, the pre-kindergarten and kindergarten, I observed one class and followed them over time. And what I found was like in the beginning, you know, they were just kind of wear their hearts on their sleeves, you know, they would and could tell you exactly what they were thinking and feeling, you know, it was just kind of very um, outright, very honest, very open. And over time, as they began to engage with the boys and the girls and the adults, um, and they started to learn like, oh, how the boys are supposed to um, identify themselves as boys, that they started to become a little bit more selective and strategic and savvy about what they showed about themselves and to whom. Because what they were learning through observation and experiences that there are consequences to how they how they present themselves and they learn to anticipate and avoid negative consequences so if they said oh barbies i love barbie dolls and the other boys kind of look at them you know askew then they realize oh maybe that's not the coolest thing to say maybe i should not say that out loud that kind of thing and so they're becoming you know more strategic and it's not that they were you know present and then not present or that they were in relationship or not but it's more that the ways in which they brought themselves into their relationships shifted. And I, they didn't tell me about this shift. I observed them and how they interacted with each other. And I experienced it in how they interacted with me. And so, um, and again, this is my 
documented in more detail in, in my book, but um, it kind of the shift in their relational pre presence reflects how they are reading and responding to their gender socialization. So, and as they aligned with group and cultural norms that emphasize, as I mentioned, toughness, stoicism, self-sufficiency, um, they began to appear, whereas they had been articulate, direct, inauthentic, and in um, sorry, articulate, direct, authentic, and attentive, they began to appear inarticulate, indirect, inauthentic, and inattentive, like stereotypical boys are often said to be. And so, and um, one of the things, and I'll just mention it briefly, because otherwise I could talk about it for too long, is they actually, there was actually like, um, they had actually formed a mean team. It was created by the boys for the boys. And for the expressed purpose of acting against the girls or identifying themselves as opposites or in opposition to the girls who were the nice team. And so that was kind of this microcosm or this really um, solid, you know, tangible example of rules because you could be fired from the mean team. So membership wasn't guaranteed just because you were a boy. You had to prove that you were one of the boys, not just be one of the boys. You could be fired from it. And one of the boys who, when he was threatened with being fired from it, they said, you know, you're fired from the mean team. You're not a boy. You're a girl. And so, and the boys knew this. And so again, like I said, they became more strategic because that there was this overarching, um, there was the promise of being included if they followed all the rules for engagement, and there was the th risk or threat of exclusion if they didn't, if they deviated. And so, and I'll go into that more in, in just a second. And so this kind of shift in boys' relational um, presence has been described as the first in a series of disconnections um, by Naomi Wei, who, who is a, a friend and colleague of mine. And she studied adolescent boys' friendships and similarly tracked that, you know, where her, the, the parallel finding was that she was finding that boys at middle school talk about their same sex best friends in loving terms. And, you know, we, we love each other where the, I couldn't live without him. He saves me from, you know, without him, I'd go, I'd go wacko, I'd go crazy. And then what happens through high school as they, you know, have to kind of man up and they become, you know, and, and that proving masculinity comes around um, is often centered on eschewing or devaluing femininity and showing that they're not homosexual or all these kinds of, there's this homophobic language around it, no homo, if they're going to put up their arm around their, their, their um, same sex friend, or if they're going to talk about something that's, you know, caring or, or like, you know, too tender or too affectionate. So this idea of like what happens to boys' friendships as again, you know, at, at um, adolescence, pressures to, to man up and to accommodate to um, social constructions of masculinity intensify for them um, or, or, or become very manifest in their daily interactions. Um, and also, so the, basically what, um, in a nutshell, in contrast to the capacity and desire that were very clearly evident in the infant studies, adolescents and adult men report having fewer same-sex friendships or having less emotionally emotional intimacy, experiencing less emotional intimacy in the same-sex friendships that they do have. And, um, and this discrepancy between you know, infancy and later life suggests that boys' development and, so, and um, socialization is associated with a move out of or away from relationships. So ironically, with age and experience, boys become less likely to establish and maintain emotionally intimate bonds, which if you think about it, doesn't make sense, right? Because as, as we have, as we grow older and as we have more experience, you'd think we'd get better at these things. So, so something's happening to counteract what we might assume to be a more natural progression. Okay, so what's happening? Well, you know, as we know, it's nature and nurture. Um, so looking at boys' gender socialization, some of the themes or some of the aspects that tend to pop up is first of all, not um, is that boys even need to prove their masculinity. That masculinity must be proven. And, you know, and in fact, it has to be proven continuously. Um, and then how messages about masculinity, again, not only aligning with constructions of masculinity, but also actively differentiating oneself from anything feminine, any one feminine, anything feminine, and learning to kind of, you know, say, I'm not that. So rejecting femininity or devaluing femininity in themselves and in other people, and then pressures to conform and align and how that works. So, um, 
let's see, I, one of the things that I use in my teaching to illustrate this is an exercise, and you'll see how I'm not very good with graphic design, but, <laughs> but I wanted to get a box on the screen, but I use this in my class, and it's actually an exercise developed originally by Paul Kivel, and he and it's been, it, he calls it the be a man box or the act like a man box. And you may have heard this term because a lot of people have since adapted to it and they'll talk about the man box. Tony Porter uses it and he calls it the man box. Um, Equimundo has written a report about the impacts on particularly on adolescent boys and young men of feeling pressure to um, to conform and stay within the man box. And you'll hear, hear also in popular discourse that men being trapped by you know, the man box. So in case you haven't come up, uh, you know, in case you haven't been exposed to um, what this activity was originally intended to illustrate and what it means, um, what we usually ask the audience is, um, what does it mean when boys are told to man up or act like a man? And so the purpose of this box is to say, whatever people say goes in that box. So they'll usually say, you know, you have to act tough. You have to, you know, be in charge. You have to be in control all the time. And those things all go inside the box. Um, and it's basically what this is really useful for is it kind of illustrates the messages and pressures that are associated with boys and men's gender socialization. So you hear messages about masculinity, the societal assumptions and expectations, the perceived norms. And most boys hear this from their fathers and other men and other boys. But, you know, they also hear them from women and girls sometimes because it's gender policing. Everybody participates in it, sadly. And so, but it's mostly defined by men, imposed on men by other men. It's some men, masculinity is in large part a performative act that's done for an audience of, of same-sex peers. So in the box is how you know, how to be a, re a real boy or man, or what it means to be a real boy or man. So it's a code of conduct, rules for engagement. And what this usually illustrates, because most audiences are quick to fill this box with exactly the things that every other audience fills it with, is that these conventions of masculinity, although we are aware, we have made some progress and we know that there are other ways to be masculine, that we are still nevertheless very familiar with this traditional image of masculine, this traditional ideal of masculinity. And so they have not yet become obsolete. There are more options, but this one is still an image to be reckoned with. And it's also been referred to as hegemonic masculinity, which just means the dominant masculinity within a given culture or society. And it's oftentimes defined in um, opposition to women. So, oops, sorry. Next, the second question usually that happens is, then you ask the audience, I ask the audience, if a boy does not do these things, you know, conform to the, you know, the qualities, have the skills, whatever, display the things that are um, emphasized within the box, what will he be called? And then the, those usually come fast and furious. So he'll be called a sissy, a mama's boy, you know, wimp, whatever, and then you and and a lot uglier stuff. So it's always an interesting chalkboard after a class where I do this activity because there's all these horrible words up on the on the, on the chalkboard. But um, and those are the consequences of deviance. So everyone knows this. They all use the same words. Um, and so you're if you're out, everything outside the box tends to be negative and tends to imply femininity and therefore, therefore weakness. And so the likelihood that the boys will be called the, those things if he's not in the box indicates the pressures boys feel to conform and stay in the box. Okay, and then the third question is, if a boy hears these things daily, what is likely to happen to him? And then again, people know very well, you know, he get teased, he'll get bullied, he'll get ostracized, he, nobody will like him, nobody will want to be with him, or, or he'll be seen as lesser than, or he'll only be able to be friends with girls, or, or you know, you know he'll, he'll be a failure in life. Sometimes it's very extreme. People go to, you know, there's a lot of kind of ideas about the negative th consequences of deviating from accepted and conventional norms. And so then the question is, is it safe for a boy to be outside that box? And the answer usually is, of course not. So then we ask, what is it safe for the boy to be inside the box? And the answer to that is not really, because you know the contents of this box represent an idea of masculinity where it's not safe when you don't conform and it's not safe when you do. And the reason it's not safe when you do is because masculinity is precarious. It is easy to get called out of the box. You can get called out. Your masculinity can get called into question by anyone at any time. If a boy holds his potato chips wrong or looks at his nails the wrong way or wears pink or likes 
I don't know, a female singer. I mean, there's one boy, an adolescent boy who said he doesn't like any songs that are sung by women. And, uh, you know, and that's just, again, a kind of alignment with this expectation that you boys aren't supposed to like anything that's associated with femininity. And in middle and high school, you'll often hear, you know, in response to this activity, you know, I don't care, I do what I want. But that protest puts them squarely inside the box under doesn't conform to peer pressure. So the evidence suggests that many boys and men still do believe in this promise that if you do these things that are in the box, then you will get power and popularity and access to male privilege or all the things associated with male privilege. But if you step out of the box, then you won't get what's coming to you as a boy or man or someone who identifies as masculine. And so, um, and that actually, uh, as a side note, that raises the question of, you know, when you do these things and you don't get what you been promised what happens. And Michael Kimmel calls that a grieved entitlement, which has popped up a lot in association with violence. When people inflict violence on themselves, it oftentimes has been linked to this sense of grieved entitlement that I haven't gotten what I deserved. And you see that with the Proud Boys in modern day examples. You see that if a lot of the angry, the anger that has been documented um, in, in recent news so there's that, um, then that's a whole other discussion. Um, but so if you, in, and so, and also the, to the extent that individuals internalize the importance of boys, men, and men being masculine, then they are also more susceptible and over time may suffer from things like low self-esteem because it's an unsustainable performance of masculinity. And there's all in it, it starts from the point of you'll never be enough. Um, and then also anxiety, because they worry that other people will discover and judge them for their alleged shortcomings or their perceived shortcomings. So um, Kibble actually, in a this is one of his handouts, he talks about this. So the, first on the sides in black, you have what goes inside that box. Like, so when they say, you know, what does it mean to be a man or what does it mean to man up? You have to be, you know, violent, mean, bullies, tough, you know, all these things. And then the, there's these also assumptions and beliefs about men, like men have no emotions, they don't make mistakes, they don't cry cry, they know about sex, they don't back down, all those things. But because, again, because it's this unattainable image, unsustainable, unattainable image, men often ultimately end up feeling angry, confused, frustrated, and all these things. When I do this exercise, when I did this exercise um, in my class, one of my students very astutely said, it's a trap. And that's absolutely true. That's one of the things that I've been hinting at, is that, first of all, like I said, um, Joe uh, Joe Pleck in The Myth of Masculinity pointed out that it's unattainable. It's ultimately unattainable. No one can be all of those things that we tell men they're supposed to be. No one can be all of those things all of the time at every age in their life, right? So boys and men are led to strive towards an image of masculinity in relation to which they will ultimately fall short, inevitably. And they that can instill an underlying sense of being unworthy, incomplete, or inferior. The second thing about it being a trap is, like I said earlier, it's precarious. And so your group membership as a man, your ability to say, I'm a real man, can is not guaranteed. It can be called into question. And so men must, men and boys must always be prepared to demonstrate or defend their masculinity, which doesn't really lead to like a comfortable <laughs> place of like self-acceptance and, and um, security. And then thirdly, is that it focuses on a singular hegemonic notion of masculinity when in fact there are multiple masculinities, many ways to be a man, many ways to be masculine, um, instead of just having one right or best way to be. It, it implies that there is one right or best way to be when in fact there are as many ways to be masculine as there are boys and men. And then finally, the messages can be very contradictory, right? So over, over the years, or depending on what society happens to favor at a given moment, or what a certain demographic in society happens to favor, you can supposed to be tough, you're supposed but yet sensitive, you're supposed to be authentic, and yet you're supposed to not, you know, be guarded and shielded and not, you know, and not show anybody what you're really thinking or feeling, or you're supposed to be rough and risk-taking and yet responsible. And so it, there's a lot of confusion around what exactly society and people are asking of boys and men and 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 there's a lot of ways to do it wrong it, it, it is this is kind of the feeling that is going around and so there's this, there's just a sense of like we're supposed to bring ourselves fully into a relationship authentically wholly and yet there's all these things that you know all these perceived um 
all these possible consequences, negative repercussions that can happen if you misstep, and which has only been exacerbated by cancel culture. But um, that doesn't only impact, obviously, male identifying people, but it doesn't help anything. Um, and again, we have these more broad versions of what boys and men and girls, you know, what gender could be. We recognize, yeah, at least we pay lip service to the fact that gender is a social construction, and yet gender biases persist. Um, in 2018, the Pew Research Center did a study and they find that biases still influence traits that are valued in each gender. So like kindness and responsibility were valued more consistently in women. Strength and ambition were valued more consistently in men. And then compassion and care were ambivalently valued in men and positive in women. So, we, you know, I think boys and men are justified in feeling a little confused when when they're told, for instance, you know, emotional men are are seen as weak and viewed negatively, and yet they're criticized for not expressing their feelings or their, you know, particularly their tender or you know, vulnerable feelings. And so, there's a lot of kind of mixed messages out there in in, in sense. So. But I do want to point out that, you know, um, masculinity is not inherently harmful. I don't like the term toxic masculinity. I think it causes a lot of problems and a lot and it, and it um, confuses what's actually the problem or what's actually harmful. I think that, you know, I don't like the word toxic altogether, but I think that we can, you know, to use borrow voicing, it's more like socialization and its discontents and particularly socialization within certain contexts and cultures where they say, again, imply that there is one right or, way, right or best way to be, and that everybody has to kind of conform to a singular notion of what's desirable and successful and healthy, and it leaves very little room for the actual individual differences that are natural <laughs> to the human condition. Um, also, you know, we can look at this in a more pragmatic way, like masculinity obviously is not inherently harmful because if you say, instead of asking what is a real man or what does it mean to man up, you can say, when, when you say someone is a good man or a great man, what are some of the words that come up then? And people know that too. So in addition to knowing the kind of conventional tough guy, whatever, stereotypical, they can also say a great man or a good man, you know, is loyal, responsible, you know, caring, reliable, dependable. There are good things. So there's nothing inherently, and also to go back to some of those, you know, tough and strong images, there's nothing inherently wrong with being tough and strong if that's just how you are. I mean, if you're an athlete and you train, you're going to be strong, physically strong. I mean, it's, there's not, I think a lot of times when I bring this up and some of my um, kids who are athletes at Stanford, I'm sorry, my students, I refer to them as my kids. Some of my kids at st students at Stanford are athletes and they'll say, oh no, you know, am I doomed? Because I'm kind of, I, I'm, I'm physically tough and I don't always cry everywhere. And, I'm, and I say, if this is what is right for you, if this is an expression of who you are, then that's not the problem. When it becomes problematic is when you feel driven to or compelled to distort and contort yourself in order to fit someone else's expectation for how you should be. That's when it becomes harm. So I, I, you know, I've written papers about kind of the aspects of socialization and how it can become problematic. One of them obviously is the content, the messages that boys hear. And it's not all of the messages, but messages where that associate masculinity with violence and aggression and not being able to express vulnerability. Yeah, that's going to be harmful. That's obviously harmful. And we do want to switch those, but simply changing the messages to a more positive, healthy masculinity is only a momentary fix and a partial fix because it's it just depends on what's trending. Oh, we used to like the macho man, but now we like the sensitive man. And tomorrow we'll have another externally, societally prescribed image that we want you to conform to. So that's only a partial solution, changing the content. Obviously change the, the harmful <laughs> associations with violence and aggression. But other than that, be wary of, you know, overly specific and narrow prescriptions for how boys and men should be. Um, the other, the more concern is when social, the, the greater concern is when socialization involves and results in disconnections from oneself in terms of one's in sense of integrity and from other people in, in terms that it can hinder their relationships. So um, let's see, let's see. Oh, one thing though, uh, sorry to go back to the messages. 
one message that would be helpful to kind of retract is the idea that they need to prove their masculinity in order to prove their worth. If we could work on not requiring people to prove them, prove their masculinity, that would help to reduce the feelings of inadequacy that are conven that are conveyed when it's suggested that you need to, you're not enough as you are, that you need to become something more or something else in order to be worthy and valued. So that in terms of the content, I would, I would, um, <laughs> recommend trying to modify it, um, if we can. The the other thing, um, ways that socialization can become problematic have to do with the context, because a lot of times the cultures of boyhood are characterized by hierarchies, competition, and antagonism. There's a very zero-sum feel to it, the sense of that, and being that in order for one person to win, the other person has to lose. So gain comes at the at the cost of somebody ha has to lose something in order for the other person to gain. There's an emphasis, therefore, on dominance, and um, and it makes trust and emotional closeness difficult. Obviously, um, the third aspect would be processes, and so how how kids are boys are responding to pressures to conform. And oftentimes those pressures come in the form of gender policing or shaming. And, you know, they, again, this like, how could you, you know, boys don't cry, it's shameful to cry or whatever, all these things that, you know, start from a very early age and leave a lingering impression that then impacts how they present and conduct themselves when they're um, interacting with other people. Um, and then, uh, let's see. And the other thing I, I mentioned, but I'll only mention it briefly, is the timing. Because I was saying, like I was saying, like, if if we believe that uh, Carol Gilligan's theory that the kind of pressures come in a little bit more intensely for girls at early adolescence and then for boys at early childhood, then we need to recognize that their cognitive de development is different. Um, they're at a more formal or abstract, you know, operations, if you use Piaget's model for girls and for boys they're in more concrete operations but to put that in more casual language is that again if girls are permitted for longer to be you know to kind of have a greater access to a fuller range of all the different um, qualities and skills and interests that are out there then they have a more ex they've accumulated more experience and practice and have maybe a greater confidence in like, oh, well, I can be all of these different things, which doesn't make it pleasant when they have to then narrow it, but at least gives them a greater sense of, no, wait, I know I can run as fast as this, or I, I know I can do this math, or I can do whatever. They don't feel maybe as constrained because they have a longer sense of a different reality, a relational reality that is in touch with who they are fully, as opposed to the constraints of a societal expectation. Whereas for boys, if they're hearing and feeling these pressures early at four or five, they have you know, literally less time, less experience, less practice of being, being confident about, for instance, their relational capabilities, that they can know about the relational world, that they can be perceptive of other people's emotions, and that they can trust what they're perceiving and know that it's accurate. So, um, yeah, so, uh, so uh, I think one of the things that I was intending to say when I mentioned boys' relational capabilities is that in contrast, to stereotypes that portray trade boys as incapable of or uninterested in emotion, the world of emotions and relationships, I found that adolescent boys and, and boys at early childhood are reading the emotional and relational worlds with interest and with accuracy, but they're not always letting on that they are. And that is partly due to their socialization, what they're taught they should and shouldn't show. Um, let me see how I'm on time. I see that I have about five minutes left. So I will start to wrap it up. And I actually am close to wrapping it up. Um, so from presence to present, this is how I described what I saw happening was that kind of from their full presence, they, there was increasing, their presence was increasingly overshadowed by their pretense. And that was this masculine posturing. So like, I don't care, you know, I do what I want. And I don't, you know, that's fine if you don't want to be my buddy anymore. I, you know, I have other buddies and things that I heard, you know, among four-year-old boys as they learned to kind of show a tough guys or a mask of masculinity to kind of maintain appearances so that they can, you know, make, you know, navigate through this world that they were perceiving to be where they perceive their vulnerabilities to be unsafe. You know, it was not safe to, to reveal their vulnerabilities. So they were learning as, as they prove their masculinity to protect their vulnerability and also in a sense, preserve their integrity that way. Because if you don't show people the things that are most vulnerable, then you protect it and you can, you can hold it in a sense, but you lose the resonance of being able to um, share that with another person and have them validate and support you and know you. Um, so boys, uh, so the, I'm sorry, 
go back to there. So from present to, so uh, part of the, uh, to sum that up, the proving masculinity by rejecting femininity, um, where, where masculinity and fem femininity are defined as mutually exclusive opposites, the boys learn to downplay or devalue what society has feminized. So again, those emotions, relationships, vulnerability, and care. Terry Real, who is a family therapist and speaks very beautifully about this, actually talked about it. Like he said, if you take the whole range of human emotions and feelings and qualities and skills and interests and capacities, and you divide it in half and you say, this half is masculine and this half is feminine, and only boys and men can be masculine and only girls and women can be feminine, then everyone loses. Because in fact, that is, you know, cutting the each, each, everyone has to cut themselves off from aspects of their humanity. Um, in terms of protecting vulnerability, um, again, becoming more guarded, feigning indifference in the adolescent boys interviews, and also in the younger boys, actually, um, whereas in the adolescent girls interviews, you start to hear, I don't know, as they learn that they're not supposed to be too smart, they're not supposed to be bossy know-it-alls, you hear in the boys interviews, I don't care. They feign dis indifference, and usually at the moments when they most care. I don't care if he doesn't want to be my best friend anymore. I don't care if they made fun of me because I like pink. I don't care, you know, so all these, it was usually a red flag to pay attention to whatever they were talking about, because you know, I don't care that my parents have separated, they both pay, still pay attention to me. So it was usually a red flag or indicator of something that was something they cared deeply about. Um, and so they were beginning to appear, you know, because of that guardedness, because of that feigned indifference, they started to appear incapable, uninterested, disengaged, and defensive, but that wasn't you know, the whole story, so to speak. Um, and then let's see what we talked about in terms of, okay, let me move on. Sorry, I'm st I realized I, two more slides and then we're good. Um, so boys dilemma is that, you know, they're at an age, at all ages, really figuring out how they can, as boys and men, be with others and in the world. They're trying to find their place, their purpose, their motivation to conform and align, form to and align with conventions of masculinity is not this kind of abstract, like, oh, I'm supposed to be a boy, you know, real boy, so I'm just going to do it. It's not this abstract thing. It's this, the young boys, especially at early childhood, what I found was that they were motivated by desire to identify with and relate to the other boys how to be one of the boys and with the boys rather than proving masculinity in general. They were not as interested in proving to some unknown you know, faceless audience that they were actual boys, but they were trying to find ways to appeal and be appealing to their peers, um, particularly the same sex peers. And so, um, and then learning these pathways to man man manhood that where they're promised that it will improve their likelihood of developing close relationships, but in, in practice actually makes it more difficult and that makes them less likely to. And then um, kind of that, again, the overshadowing of present pretense over present. So they learn to project an image of masculinity that's familiar to all of us because it's more aligned with the stereotypes and assumptions that we and expectations we have of boys, but misrepresents them. And so as Brene Brown has pointed out, there's a difference between fitting in, which means I can be like you, and belonging, which means I can be myself, right? And their ability, to, they're, they're learning to accommodate to those societal norms and expectations is, of course, socially adaptive, but comes at a cost to their relationships, to their psyches. It enables them to fit in, but it in undermines their sense of belonging. It constrains their self-expression, what they can, you know, it forces a split between what they know and what they show, and thereby hinders the kinds of relationships that have been found to be protective. It makes it harder for them to engage with others, and it makes it harder for others to engage with them. So it you know, effectively keeps people at a distance and creates the possibility that one can have relationships and yet still feel lonely. So, and, and again, by, you know, it, to the extent that presence, our, our presence depends on relationships and vice versa, and that relationships enable, as studies have shown, healthy resistance and resilience, this impacts their well-being. So, um, okay, let's see. So the last finding, the good news is that there's also evidence of voice healthy resistance. So as individual agents, they're active participants in their socialization development. They are not passive recipients of culture or victims of their socialization. They make meaning, they respond, they mitigate. Well, they, they make me, they can, 
they have an influence in how they make meaning of the messages, how they respond to the pressures, and then how they can therefore mitigate the effects, particularly the negative effects of their socialization. And that aligning and conforming to conven um, conventions of masculinity is not automatic nor inevitable. And there are group and individual differences in the extent to which they incorporate and internalize these things. Um, also, so, uh, even though their relational capabilities become less apparent, they're not lost. So we see resilience and perseverance. They continue throughout their lives to seek connections and resist disconnections. And there's evidence that they are interested and invested in being, in preserving and being known for a version of themselves that feels honest and whole. And finally, the protective relationships is again, this access to validation, acceptance, belonging and support is incredibly um, essential to being able to maintain that healthy resistance. And so that's where we come in as you know, practitioners, as educators, as parents, as friends um, of, of boys and men, this is where we can offer support. And so um, let's see. I think I'm going to, I have some key findings, but I also see that I'm short on time. So maybe I will stop and then maybe I will offer um, some of my, some of the things that I gleaned that boys tell me, because in listening to boys, I, I often emphasize that boys can tell you what they need. And if you, so if you listen to them, they can tell you what they need and I can tell you what some of them said, um, but I want to give it back to Dr. Katzman so we could do questions and maybe the, the, those, my re I can fit that into my responses to the questions. Oh my gosh. <clears throat> so great to listen to you. I could I could just listen for another hour and and uh, makes me proud to have been a hum bio major like you and kind of the way that that major uh, got all of us to think about biology and culture and society and, and the way that they influenced each other long ago. And it, it's just, um, it's it's an honor for me to uh, to see uh, where people from our major have, have gone in the work that you're doing. So let me just start with that. And also a, a common memory I have from, not a, a unique memory I have from Stanford is I got to hear Carol King play in our dorm. And I'm so glad I'm not one of those guys that says I won't I won't hear women singers because um, that was one of my greatest uh, memories from Stanford. So uh, just a, a, a few quick, quick remarks. Uh, so many questions are rolling in and everybody out there, please use the Q&A function to, uh, uh, to put in questions. There are a lot rolling in, and I'm gonna start us off with something I'm interested in. Uh, you mentioned kind of the growing interest um, from Vivek Murthy and others around loneliness and this epidemic, and I'm interested in your thoughts about uh, what you're talking about now and social, socialization of men and kind of rejecting this relationality um, through the social, socialization process and its connection to loneliness, there's a question about um, men in, in older age groups um, being more lonely and kind of your general thoughts about how those are connected. Oh, absolutely. I think, um, so, so one of the other organizations that wasn't listed because I've recently stepped down was I worked with the Movember, found, Movember which um, particularly on mental health and suicide prevention. And to my surprise, because I had thought that suicide rates were highest in adolescents and young people, but they're actually highest in like 45 to 65 year olds. And I think that a lot of that has to do with, you know, multiple factors, but including kind of the, the conventions of masculinity that were dominant when they were growing up. And then also just kind of, um, you know, and, 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 uh, a lack of resources in you know societally speaking i mean i think that a lot of times they they feel they may be rec less re less willing to reach out but what they report at least in terms of studies is that oftentimes when they do reach out there is you know because this is a relatively new field in in relation to their age um that it hadn't been incorporated um well enough at the times when they reached out so that they they would they would often stop treatment because they weren't getting what they wanted some of um, there's i remember one of my students wrote a literature review on this and she said you know men with report saying like they'd go in it took a lot of courage on their part to seek help and to actually go in and then they were basically told to man up which is exactly the opposite of what they needed to hear in treatment so i think i mean obviously that i i would hope that that never happens 
anymore, but I think there is still a lot of room for all of us to, to learn how best to respond to men and to, to kind of consider and view their experiences and their struggles through a gendered lens. I think for a long time and until very recently, people didn't really think about boys and men as having a gender and of, of and, and much less that how gender would impact the way they, um, they act. Um, I think one of the things has to do, oh, so one of my, the strategies um, uh, is linked to the title of a paper written by Irene Stiver, who works at the, who worked at the Wellesley Center for Research on Women and Gender. And it was about called honoring the strategies of disconnection. And so really understanding that there are reasons why boys and men do the way, things they do and why they feel the way they do, and to understand the reasons why. And of course, we can kind of, uh, guess at some of the general factors that contribute to loneliness, particularly in adult men, but to also really in individual, you know, casework kind of um, checking in. So that was the other thing is the first thing I lead with is usually start with listening and use a voice-centered relational method to really understand the person that you happen to be in the room with, the person that you're trying to understand, the person that you're trying to help um, listen with interest and respect and humility and making spaces for them to be open and honest. I know it's not easy to do, but it's also, um, I know that for me, it's easy to come in with my own you know, assumptions and that um, that it, it's really hard work actually to listen with an open mind and an open heart. Um, but again, people can tell you what what um, what they need or show you what they need if they know that you're really interested. And I'm, I, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir and, and I know that you're all heroes in this respect. And so I forgive me for say, telling you things you already know. But, um, but in terms of understanding and honoring the um, strategies of disconnection, you know, they're doing what works. And, but even if it's not working, right? So that's the, the loneliness piece. It's like, this is how they've always done it. This is what they've always known or been told they, how they should do it. And so it's it's really baby steps and a whole kind of re, re revisioning of, for them, a reimagining of how they can be um, uh, in ways that are more conducive to maintaining their connections to themselves and to others. What I like to say, and this is a Stanford specific ref reference and forgive me, is that Stanford, they used to have, you know, whenever they had parties with alcohol, to legal people, of course, um, they had to offer ENAPs, which meant you know, equally attractive non-alcoholic beverages. So if you had, you know, beer, you also had to have, you know, club sodas and so something that tasted really good. And so this is what I, how I apply it to the strategies for disconnection is you can't ask them, you can kind of unearth all of their defenses and ask them to abandon them unless you offer them somewhere solid to stand on, somewhere to land. And it has to be an equally effective and practical and relevant um, strategy that they can, that they can slowly try to incorporate. But I digress. Again, sorry, Dr. Katzman. So, but um, yeah, for, for loneliness, I think definitely, I think it's it's not um, specific to a gender, but I think it definitely um, things about the socialization towards masculine, um, social constructions of masculinity are uh, definitely put people more at risk of feeling lonely because again, that need to constantly prove yourself prove your worth and to feel like there's this huge risk of being canceled or being tramped, trampled on. Um, one of the adolescent boys said to me, you know, I, you can't just spill your guts to anybody because more often than, you know, not only do you put yourself at risk of being taken advantage, granted or taken advantage of, but more likely than not someone will. And so that there's that perception of hostility and judgment mm -hmm. and antagonism that keeps a lot of boys and men from venturing out of their comfort zone because they've learned that it's not safe. And so we need to be much more intentional in creating those spaces and facilitating those kinds of discussions that they very much want to have and are amazing when the space is made available. They're incredibly good at having them. Fantastic. I could talk to you really for a long time about this, but there are 21 uh, questions in the chat. So here we go. Uh, starting from our uh, president of Silver Hill Hospital, Dr. Gerber, who's puts in this comment for us. Uh, there's a lot of important conversation in our society about groups that have historically benefited from privilege and the importance of our working together to acknowledge these structural issues in our society, which may be improving, but are not gone. Even if an individual may not think they have benefited from such privilege, for example, being someone identified as white, a necessary step for increasing equality is that we acknowledge that this is happening. Is there a parallel in thinking about the history and ongoing reality of male privilege 
Is it okay for boys to say there's no such thing as male privilege? Or is that something that we could be teaching boys? That's a great question. Um, and it really gets to the heart of it because that has, I think, contributed to a lot of the defensiveness, by, especially among boys and men, because they'd be like, privilege, I don't feel privileged. You know? And I think it's helpful sometimes to distinguish between you know, the abstract boys, men as a group versus the actual individual you know, it, what the individuals experience, because there are a lot of individuals who don't feel that they've had the advantages that are said to, they're said to have, but they, it also isn't useful for them to dismiss the idea that historically, you know, men as a group haven't been the privileged, um, haven't been privileged, enjoyed certain privileges. And so just to kind of distinguish between those things and, and, and to hold the complexity, I think in general, and I'm sure many of you have observed this as well, there's a strong push to oversimplify things. And I think the more that we can, you know, consider nuances and sit with complexity and say, yes, that's true. And this other thing is true too. So yes, men have enjoyed privileges historically, but individuals have, that doesn't negate the fact that individuals are struggling or that they, you know, either to, you know, struggling with issues. It doesn't mean that just because somebody else had bigger problems or more problems that you don't also have problems in, in a way. So again, it's not this zero sum thing where we're needing to defend an all or nothing stance. It's really, um, really moving people to consider, consider it more kind of, and, and really kind of resisting the tendency, the, the pull to blame, which I think it has become a really unfortunate part of a lot of our national conversations or, or our broader societal conversations. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another question here. Does your study uh, uh, or other studies, um, do they examine the correlation between the suppression of emotions in males to the occurrence and escalation of male violence? Or I, even expanding on that question, can can you talk a bit about kind of violence in, in, in the world and, and potentially um, what you've presented today? I can, but first I should mention that there are far more qualified experts, including um, Carol's husband, Jim, James Gilligan, wrote a trilogy of books on violence. He worked for several decades with the most violent criminals in prisons. And but you know, very much aligned with this kind of relational framing of development, found that oftentimes the ones who inflicted um, the most severe violence were often also victims of severe violence and trauma and abuse. And I think that you know those are kind of more extreme examples of the shame of the um, of the processes that can lead to. And I, I'm wary about using this term because I know it's a very clinical term, but like dissociation or disconnections that can result when, in a self protective way, as we're trying to negotiate and navigate through things that aren't necessarily conducive to, to um, maintaining integrity in relationships. And so there's something, I think that most, um, at least based on Jim's first book, Violence, uh, you know, I think he said like less than 1% are born just violent. So it, it, most of it is a learned or, um, or a consequence of something that has happened to them. And if, if we take that to be true, then we can kind of, um, say that, okay, well, what's happening that, again, what, what what parts of their socialization and development are involving or resulting in disconnections? And where can we intervene in ways that help those disconnections that are unnecessary, happening unnecessarily? How can we help to prevent those from happening? How can we restore or preserve? And it's really not about, I mean, this is, you know, just an adjacent topic, but like, it's, um, I think one of the concerns is always like, oh, you're just turning boys into girls or men into women. And it really isn't. It's so that again falls into the trap of gendering, you know, health and wholeness and well-being and relationships and all these things that are inherently a part of our humanity of gendering those feminine. We're not trying to turn boys into girls. We're trying to help boys preserve or return to, stay with or return to qualities and skills that they were born with. Again, the infant studies show that this is something that is inherent to the human condition. And so what's happening? What what's, you know, one of the questions that drove my research was like, you know, what does boys' development and socialization look like when we start from the premise, as the infant studies show, that they are born with a capacity and desire for relationships? What is moving them away? What is making it more difficult for them to stay in connection? And those, and we know that those disconnections, again, from James Gilligan's work and others, we know that those disconnections are harmful to them and the people around them. So how can we 
intervene or prevent those kinds of, you know, the, the disconnections that are happening unnecessarily from happening or to a lesser extent, or to, to even to be aware. I often distinguish between compromise and overcompromise because I know that, again, it's one of those blanket statements. We say, oh, you know, you should never compromise. Compromise is bad, whatever. Anytime two people are in a relationship, you have to compromise because no one can have their way all the time, right? But you want to distinguish that from overcompromise, which is the sense where you have to take yourself out of relationship in order to preserve the appearance of relationship, and you no longer have a voice in relationship. Overcompromise is when you're giving up to the point where you might even become unaware yourself of what you actually think and feel and want. Because as one of the adolescent boys said, you know, he goes, I'm really, I'm a perfect chameleon. I can be whatever people need. Do not ask me what I really think. And he actually became angered by it, which surprised me. But this idea that everybody wants something from you, they want you to be a certain way, just, you know, so just make it easy and let's cut out the, you know, cut it out and just go straight. No, don't pretend you actually want to know what I think. Just tell me what you need me to be. And that's what successful boys and men learn, right? How do I be what everyone else needs to be? But at a loss that again, circle to circle back leads to loneliness, leads to a sense of nobody really knows me, even if I'm successful, they don't they don't see who I actually am and there's no mm. space for me to come in to a relationship that feels real and true to me. And so that um, again feels isolated even if they're surrounded, it feels lonely even if they have thousands of followers or Facebook friends or whatever. Yeah, profound. Um, right. Let's, so it brings us to a question from Jill Paglino who says, hi, Dr. Chu, I signed up for this because I saw you featured in The Mask You Live In. Thank you for your research. My question is, here you go. Do we have to do this for the rest of human history? And do you think it's ever going to end? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, I would love to this not to not be, I mean, in fact, in the 20 years that I've been teaching this, I every year thought, surely everyone knows this by now. We've already known it from for decades. And now more than ever, people are paying attention. Like I said, it's it's very gives me makes me feel hopeful that there is a national conversation happening about it right now. But as with the pandemic coming out of the pandemic, where everyone's like, oh, we, you know, there's this moment where we can change everything. And for the most part, it seems like changing has only gone back to what people have been trying to do, what was there before. That makes me worry. But I, I'm still, you know, there are still lots of spaces and people who make me hopeful, um, you all included, because I feel like by listening in the ways that you do and trying to be there for people in the ways they most need, that's what will change the people themselves and that so it'll change the societal norms and so you know they always talk about like it can't just be telling individuals you need to do more of this we also need to change the situation um and and you know systemic change and all these things and the way that we shift social norms is by actually create you know first of all dispelling the um dispelling misconceptions about the way people actually are, right? And that's by coming into connection, which you all do every time you interact with your clients and, and the people you work with. And then also um, that, you know, because I was always wondering, well, how do you change social norms? Is there somewhere like a billboard where you kind of announce that the norm is something different? But it's through modeling, again, coming back to the heroics that you, you all exhibit, modeling in the way that you conduct yourself, the way that you interact with people, and what you show to your children, right? Um, the Ms. Foundation, and I'll wrap up with this because I know you have to go, but like, and, and then we're coming to the end of time, although I'm happy to stay a little longer. Um, the Ms. Foundation years ago, was pressed to find something that was as appealing to boys as the take your daughters to work was for girls. And so one of the ideas that they had come up with was buttons for men to wear and also for women, for all people to wear that said, a boy is watching you, which you could also say a child is watching you. What is he learning about men, about women, about relationships, about this? And so we're all role models and we're all contributing to the perception of what the societal norm is. And the sooner that we can call, you know, that the emperor has no clothes, that patriarchy has no clothes, that this is not serving boys and men, that patriarchy, which is meant to serve boys and men or privileged boys and men, actually is a Harm, harmful in different ways and to different extents than it is to, you know, people who identify as female, but that this is not working. It's not making us happy. So hopefully sooner rather than later, we won't have to keep doing this work because if we can stem it earlier on, I mean, obviously we want to do interventions for the people who have been living with this for a long time, but if we can also start early and recognize that this is the right a better path, um, as Carol says, and I'll wrap up, I promise. Um, she says, if we can begin to, uh, no, asking how things came to be this way or understanding that 
so that we can begin to imagine how things can be another way. And when we begin to imagine it, then we start to do it. And when we start to do it, then it becomes our new reality. So hopefully that's where we're heading. Great, so many more questions out there, but uh, my, my clock just clicked on the hour. So I think um, I think we need to leave it here. I, um, I don't know if it's okay if people can reach out to you if they have specific questions. Absolutely, let me get to. You can you can I um my email address is J U D Y C H U seven two year I was born at gmail.com. That's the best way to reach me. And I'm happy. I'm so sorry I rambled for so long and didn't leave enough time for questions, but I'm happy to answer questions via email. So yeah, please I'm do reach so, out if I so generous of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for being here with us. And we hope to have you back or even um, in person on our our campus uh, one, one of these days. I um, wanna thank everybody for joining us today and for people wishing to receive continuing education credits, uh, just complete the evaluation survey that'll automatically show in the browser as we end the webinar. Hope to see you in a couple of weeks uh, on the 24th for our grand rounds around domestic violence with Dr. Elaine Alpert. And uh, as I always say, our goodbye on, on uh, this format feels a little jarring and sudden. So thank you all for being with us today. And uh, Dr. Chu, just um, so much gratitude for being with us and see thank you all in a couple of weeks. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye.